Conan Arda Talavietta Bia Gusmara. We now proceed to leaders' questions. Understanding order. Uh, now, Deputy Pierce Doherty, please. Come. Gormaigat a can call you. Um, I guess in ye her and pre-wabic is off exaggerated. Ni small drosh gilar foil. The abrinly gets the highly to get a dollar in Jimmy. A tihiakte. I guess the price in it nesh tihiakte ni zarjan na vision lele ni am and tiger kelcha. Sample ella a can call you than chip da or flan tihiakte and realty. So guess ni hockey Jerry listen gear kim tihiakte show. Gadigame at how policy on I guess at how realty on a mahurumse. Tanishe, yesterday the CSO published a report on property prices and it contains more bad news for workers and for families looking to buy a home, with many of them desperate now for, for somewhere to call a home that is affordable. Today we've reached a new milestone, Tanishe. House prices are now higher than they were during the Celtic Tiger era. Spiraling house prices confirm that your government's housing plan is failing. Home ownership, the dream of many Irish families, is in decline, all on your watch. And the consequence of all this is that too many people are forced into an expensive and insecure private rental sector that doesn't meet their needs. And it's a vicious spiral tonnage. The only way that this housing crisis is going to be brought to an end is with a general election, a change of government and a change of housing plan. Because all of the evidence, all of it shows that your policies are making things worse. Your affordable housing targets are pathetically low. And even these low targets are not being met, Tanisha. In fact, the fact is, Tanisha, do you agree with this? That the government has failed to meet its affordable housing targets every year. In 2020, in 21, in 22. And it seems that the Minister for Housing is so embarrassed by his own failures in terms of affordable housing that he is refusing to publish the number of affordable homes that were delivered last year. We still don't have them. And it is the fact that many of these homes that are being delivered are not affordable in the first instance for most workers and families. So let us not pretend that affordable homes and with all in costs of €435,000 in parts of Dublin are somehow affordable for ordinary workers and families because they're simply not. It is time for a change of direction, Tanisha. And what we need is a plan, a plan that meets the scale of the challenge we face. And Sinn Féin has that plan. Capacity, pace, affordability are key. But also political willingness, political priority is also a key. And in our engagement with builders, with approved housing bodies, with other players in the market, they're all saying the same thing. That there is capacity to do more with proper state support. So if it is not the number one government of priority, then the housing crisis is going to continue as it has done every single year under your term. Four years now since the general election, Tanisha. Four years now. Is it not fair to say that when we measure... Your government's performance against house prices, against rents, against homelessness, against home ownership, that you've not just failed, that you've failed spectacularly. We have an entire generation, the length and breadth of this state, who are locked out of home ownership and who are losing all hope in the future of a future in this country. And that's the reality. I'm sure you've met them as much as I've met them. They're leaving in their droves to London and Canada to the US and many of them going now to Australia. So Tanisha, can I ask you to honestly answer these questions? Do you accept that you missed your affordable housing targets every year since you entered government? Because it's a fact. Do you accept that? Do you accept that runaway house prices, even surpassing the Celtic Tiger era, are locking entire generations out of home ownership? And do you accept that it is now time for a plan that delivers affordable housing at scale and where homes are genuinely affordable for ordinary workers and families, something that your government has failed to produce up until now? Well, I just part of the ANT and the election and talk to all and talk to Morris. Neil and Oris, I will do the key in the feshkind. Oh, of course, it's a tear to a tear show. Can Oris is a show on Ibis Moor Targwing, Philohir Satir, 
agus an aimas mo atay gan rieltas na níos mo te a hó gael agus a crahu níos mo caoir agus tacíoch to hort de guini a bhfuil ag iarracht an chéad a chéad teach a chéanach agus tan a figuri a hún a leirín go bhfuil anachuid scéimeanna anachuid áisne a hún anis con caoir agus tacíoch to hort de guini. I disagree entirely with your presentation, Deputy. And in the first instance, I know your complete uh, absence of any reference to social housing at all. Um, and I understand politically why you're doing that, of course, because you're approximating to the centre because you don't really want change or you're not radically approaching the issue at all. And the reason I say that is, of course, you didn't want to highlight that between 22 and 23, up to 22,000 social houses have been delivered by this government, which is a record high. Uh, and, we've, and there's about 26,000 uh, more social homes in the pipeline. On the affordable, uh, you talk about change. Your change would be a change for the worse. And why do I say that, through the Chair? Because you've proposed in your alternative Sinn Féin budget, and you published it, you approved, approved, proposed the abolition of the Help to Buy scheme, which has supported over 40,000 home buyers. So you would get rid of that support for affordability to enable young people to be able to afford to buy their first home. You would scrap the first home scheme, which gives up to 30% uh, equity share in new properties, uh, which would enable people to be able to buy their homes. So the state would take up to 30%. 2,600 approvals already under that scheme in just over one year. But you would scrap that again. And you would eliminate the new vacant and derelict property grants of 70,000 with over 4,500 applications in now already and 200 approvals um, to, to, to date. And you would scrap very significant supports in terms of affordable housing in your budget of up to 260 million um, worth. That's, that is what you have proposed. And the issue is you don't have a plan. You have a few pages stitched together, as in your, house, your Sinn Féin housing policy budget, which we have read. So you would scrap support for home ownership. You would increase taxes on inheriting the family home. Uh, by a substantial close to 36,000 on the average family home, you would actually scrap it. Um, and you would also then, uh, as I say, abolish the key schemes that give real support uh, to, to young people who want to buy their first homes. And 550 first-time buyers each week are now buying their first home. Mortgage drawdowns for first, by first-time buyers has reached a new peak, about 26,000 in 2023. That's the highest annual level since 2007, which you did not um, acknowledge. And we've expanded the Help to Buy scheme. And we want to do more. And we have to do more, given the population increase and the scale of the challenges um, out there. But we have substance in our planning. We're not opposing projects like Oscar Trainer, which you did, or Ballymas Stone, um, or other big projects that would have delivered social and affordable housing much faster if it wasn't for all the prevarication that you people engaged in on the councils, uh, particularly um, in, in, in Dublin in, in, in particular. But you have just sound bites, Deputy. I've, you're, you're about four or five pages. That's all you have of a plan. And you keep talking about change. It's a great sound bite. It's the oldest sound bite in elections. Vote for change. But I would warn people not to vote for the abolition of the Help to Buy scheme. Don't vote for the abolition of the vacant, the vacant house grant or the deadlift house grant. Don't vote for the abolition um, of the first home scheme. Don't vote for abolishing key supports for first-time buyers in this country who want to own well, their own home. There is one thing that's clear from you. We'll get no change from you. Because in fairness, you're consistent. Because the last time you were in government, Deputy Martin, you drove house prices off a cliff. But now you're in for the last four years and now you've even surpassed Celtic Tiger periods. Mm -hmm. You talk about sound bites. It's not a sound bite to say that house prices are running away. It's not a sound bite for the 21,000 people who packed their bags and decided to go to Australia because they feel that they have no hope in this country anymore. It's not a sound bite to point out the reality that an entire generation is locked out of home ownership. It is not a sound bite to point out the facts that in all of the measurements, all of the measurements, runaway house prices, rents never as high, homelessness and child homelessness never as high as the history of the state, and home ownership declining. That is the result of your policies. Now, you may go into conclave and pat yourselves on the back and think you're doing a great job. You are not. There is a housing disaster in this country. 
a housing disaster under your watch. And what, what people cannot afford, what people cannot afford is more Fine the Gale and Fianna Fáil policy that pushes up house prices and that fails to deliver on their own plans of delivering affordable housing. I note that you didn't answer one of my questions. Do you accept that you miss the targets every single year that you've been in government? Do you accept that runaway house prices is locking out an entire generation? And do you accept that you need a new plan because we can't afford for prices to continue to go up this way? We can't afford for rents to continue to skyrocket. We can't afford for more children to be in emergency accommodation. And we can't afford for house ownership to decline as it is under your watch. And where the hell is your plan? You've produced nothing in four years. Three pages in a 52-page budget document. Three pages on housing. Where is your plan, Deputy? You're all sound, noise and fury, and you have no substance on any um, of this. 33,000 houses were built last year. 33,000, which is in excess of the target set in Housing for All. Last year, in 2022, the tar the 29,500 in excess of the target that was set in Housing for All. The targets are being exceeded. But Deputy, you have a responsibility. We understand that housing is the biggest issue facing the families across this country. We have never hidden that reality. Our population is increasing. There are challenges out there. But the supports we brought in place are enabling young people to buy the houses in this country at levels that they haven't been able to do before. Do we want to do more? Of course we do. But please, I beg you, Deputy, and you haven't responded to the assertions that I have made. There is no plan to help young people. What your plan is, your plan through the chair, is to abolish supports to first-time buyers and undermine their capacity to afford new houses. That is the essence of your three-pager in your 52-page budget. You're all sound, you're fluster and no substance. Look at this. Please. This has become an irregular routine on a Thursday. Will we, can, we just behave, can we just behave in a slightly orderly way, please? We go to Deputy Ivana Batchik. Deputy Batchik. Tanishta, there was more, more grim news this week, as we know, for the thousands of people desperate to find a secure and affordable home. We know that house prices are now higher than the Celtic Tiger peak, yet your government's building targets remain too low. Four months since the Taoiseach admitted to me in leaders' questions that more ambition would be needed. So, Tanishta, instead of housing for all, it seems we're still stuck with housing just for some. And those struggling to find an affordable home to rent must continue to compete with short-term tourist lettings. It's five years, Tanishta, since the Oireachtas first debated our Labour bill to regulate Airbnb-style lets. And now we understand that the European Commission is still delaying a decision on your government proposal to do just that. You must remind the Commission how dire the housing crisis is here. You must tell them there is urgency to this, Tanishta, uh, because we can't afford to wait any longer for EU proposals. For years, we We've called for stronger, stronger regulation of short-term letting. We know just how many homes these platforms take out of use because during the pandemic, suddenly they all became available. But that situation has now been allowed to worsen again. Building back better post-COVID has made its way out of the lexicon and instead prospective buyers and renters are being victimised by a profit-driven market and laissez-faire policies in the Department of Housing. Tónishta, renters in Ireland are still at the whim of landlords and there has been no tangible strengthening of renters' rights since the general election. No fault evictions are still taking place, even though we in Labour proposed a bill to stop them. And while private, private rented sector inspections have gone up since the pandemic, enforcement is practically non-existent in many areas. Not a single prohibition notice was issued in 10 local authority areas last year. Tanishta, homelessness figures will be out tomorrow. No one is under any illusion that there will be good news this month. Because every day across the country, tenants are living in fear of the dreaded call to tell them that they will be losing their home. It's a wild west for renters out there. Just ask the tenants of Mark Goddard. And I want to give credit to the Irish Times for pulling back the veil on what is really going on for renters in the properties of this Luxembourg investor. Goddard has deployed CCTV to monitor his tenants. He's accused of unlawful evictions. He has failed to pay compensation to former tenants who won at the RTB. He has summarily fired his workers. And we hear about ruthless working conditions for those who work for him. 
Tarnished the latest documents revealed by the Irish Times show that he is now trying to recruit people to act as fronts for his property empire, to get others to use their identities to set up Airbnb accounts. So across a range of legal frameworks, he is riding roughshod over the rights of tenants and of workers, and he appears to be operating with impunity. And this is very serious. Yesterday, we know he avoided prosecution for breaches of planning laws. Yes, his companies were fined €7,500, but Tonishta, that's probably only a few days' takings in some of his city centre Airbnbs. So Tonishta, my question is, are we going to continue to allow unscrupulous landlords to exploit legal loopholes, to exploit renters, many of whom are desperate for a roof over their heads, and to exploit Thank workers, you, it seems? Tonishta, when will short-term lets be regulated, and how will you tackle egregious abuses of the law by the small number of unscrupulous landlords like Goddard? Tonishta, please. First of all, I thank the Deputy for raising a number of issues there under the umbrella of renting and so on, but it's not true to say that no additional protections have been put in place for for renters, quite a significant number of protections in terms of, for example, the notice to termination, uh, the length of time has been expanded, uh, and so on, uh, that landlords are obliged, obliged to give notice. Um, you are correct in, in terms of short-term tourist letting, um, and the Commission um, has um, sought further time uh, in terms of the short-term tourism letting legislation, uh, which would provide a statutory basis for the establishment of the STTL register. Uh, and uh, I think that is frustrating in terms of, uh, because there is an issue there in terms of um, uh, that issue. And there is, as you know, in November, the, par the Parliament and the Council, they reached a provisional political agreement on the EU uh, STR proposal. So those issues are still um, with, 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 the, with the Commission. We've also brought in a rent credit for renters, about 750 uh, euros now, and that has been taken up. Uh, by a substantial number of renters, but not all renters, which is something that needs to be explored as well, I, su I suggest. I too would pay tribute to, to Naomi O'Leary in the Irish Times for a very, very comprehensive investigative analytical piece um, in terms of Mark God uh, Goddard, um, and it is extremely concerning and worrying. Um, and in my view, and um, I have read the article, and I intend to talk to other ministers about it, but it seems to me that the Corporate Enforcement Authority should be interested um, in, in, in this article in terms of the whole issue of um, nominees, um, in terms of the paper directors, uh, shadow Airbnb, Airbnb accounts, ruthless staff practices, so there's issues around labour law, it seems to me arising from reading that article, um, in terms of perhaps a role for the WRC or others in respect, or labour inspectors, uh, to investigate further how employees were treated um, in that company. You, you read about um, arbitrary deductions of salary, uh, arbitrary firings of people, people being told, or people being directed who are superior to these workers um, to, to make sure they worked a week even as we're firing them, make sure they worked a month even as we're firing them. Some with no language, with huge language, some from South America, for example, with no language capacity, um, and they're told uh, that's not enough. And, all the, and their only crime was to allow inspectors from Dublin City Council in to inspect the premises. And a person got fired for facilitating an inspection by Dublin City Council. Um, that's very serious in my view, and Dublin City Council perhaps also. So you're looking at a range of authorities from my reading of it. Um, environment, these were environmental health officers that within on that occasion. Now, they found they couldn't enforce because there was no, no one occupying uh, the, the property. So I think under corporate, uh, I think the Corporate Enforcement Authority should be interested from a layperson's reading of this. Um, I think employment law breaches clearly on the surface reading of this seem to be uh, highlighted. And then in terms of the Thank City you. Council's nice role uh, and potentially other authorities, and I'm conscious of my Restrictions in parliamentary terms, I don't want to, you know, yeah, I don't want to stay within the... We're over time now. Thank you. Well, I'll, 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 I'll be back to that. I also want to commend Naomi O'Leary. Her article makes for chilling reading, and undoubtedly there are issues there around the arbitrary deductions from workers' wages, around workplace practices. But just to return to the issue of uh, Goddard's treatment of his tenants, and what is your government going to do to ensure that unscrupulous landlords like Goddard 
will be made accountable, that there will be some comeback. Because clearly, neither local authorities nor the Residential Tenancies Board currently have power or capacity to regulate the small number, undoubtedly, of egregious abuses in the rental sector. So what I'm asking you today is, will you bolster the RTB to crack down on those who are exploiting tenants? And clearly, they're not representative of the vast majority of landlords. But right now, the RTB Investigations and Sanctions Unit can only levy fines up to €15,000. And that's not enough to deal with people like Goddard. In the 90s, we saw how Labour Minister for Finance, Rory Quinn, created the Criminal Assets Bureau to go after the assets of criminals, seizing property and going after ill-gotten cash. But what we need now is an enforcement mechanism within the RTB with real powers to go after the small number of unscrupulous landlords who are making life a misery for far too many. Because, Tanish, to reading Naomi O'Leary's piece, I think all of us will, be, will recall the, you know, sort of practices from out of, sort you, of 19th Deputy century Tynes Land League times. This is why the Land League was set up, calling for fair rent, fixity of tenure, Time decent off, Deputy, conditions please. for renters. And we're seeing some appalling conditions still prevailing for renters in off, Dublin please. and across the country today. Yeah, I think uh, there's two points here. First of all, uh, the, uh, Naomi O'Leary's article on, on, on Mark Goddard is shocking. And I've identified the list of authorities uh, of, for whom um, the content of that article and his behaviour and, and the behaviour should be um, a matter of interest. And I, and, and I would add the Gardaí to that um, as well, potentially, in terms of how... If the law is broken, the law is broken. There are enforcement mechanisms to enforce the law. And we have invested record amounts now in the RTB. Uh, I mean, 13.4 million in 2024 for the RTB, uh, 10.75 million for local authorities, um, inspections in the rental sector, and for the regulation of short-term um, lettings. And the rent laws are there. They set out very clear requirements and obligations on landlords, which the RTB can inf investigate and enforce. I don't think it's that the investigations or enforcement are at the scale they should be, it seems to me, given the overall numbers. And this, this creates a huge challenge reputationally for the broader rental market when you have people uh, like Mr. Goddard um, um, behaving in a manner Thank you, uh, that, he, that, he, that, he, that he clearly has behaved in, uh, as evidenced by that article in the Irish Times. Uh, and um, so I think the, the, we have enforcement authorities to enforce the law when it is broken. And I think Thank you. they now should give their attention to we this. We have the Rural Independent Group, Deputy McGrath. Very good. Um, Taoiseach, I want to bring to your attention at the potential government cover-up regarding the upcoming referendums. On Monday the 12th of February, the former Attorney General and Justice Minister, Senator Michael McDowell, accused Minister Radical O'Gorman of hiding vital information regarding the upcoming referendums in March. Senator McDowell's allegations suggest a significant cover-up by the government, and it is a matter that must be urgently addressed. I am today calling for the government to come clean and tell the truth, which is a difficulty for this government. Why would the Minister refuse to share the detailed notes from the crucial meetings from the Interdepartmental Group, which considered the two referendums? These were no ordinary meetings, Taoiseach. They were discussions that have uh, grave impacts on our uh, citizens and our constitution. These notes uh, can, uh, could shed light on how the changes to our laws might impact on taxation and our taxes, social welfare, and uh, indeed pensions, immigration, and indeed even family reunification for asylum seekers, uh, landowners, farmers, everything else. But with, by withholding this information, the government is essentially keeping us all in, in the dark, which is not only unfair but downright dis disrespectful to the public. It's just not a few meetings, ordinary meetings, they're keeping secret. It's notes from a staggering 16 uh, meetings, and they're uh, also withholding a correspondence with the NGO tour. The excuse you claim, and your government claim, is, is too early to uh, share, uh, sharing this, it might, might uh, sway the vote. But it's, let us call it what it is. The government are deliberately delaying the truth until after we've cast our votes. Uh, the manipulation and uh, mis uh, misinformation goes against the very uh, principles of democracy. Even the Electoral Commission can't uh, provide us with a clear picture of the consequences of these referendums. They're essentially telling us we'll figure it all out later. We have, uh, I said, we have, we have, we, there is downright a cover up uh, designed to keep, up, keep us in the dark and said, prevent us from making informed decisions. We have every right to demand transparency and access to the relevant information before we vote. We must stand up against this uh, injustice and uh, demand an immediate publication of these uh, crucial minutes. And the government, um, 
uh, and he, given the government's lack of transparency and accountability, it is clear that voting no is the only uh, sensible uh, choice. We cannot allow ourselves to be uh, manipulated by the, uh, those in power who prioritise their own priorities before they do for our people, and we've seen that so many times. So will you, Tony, uh, commit to immediately publishing the detailed notes uh, from these meetings of the inter interdepartmental group, uh, which considered the two referendums, uh, to ensure that the public will be, will be fully aware of the consequences and, and ensure full transparency ahead of the referendum on March 8th. It is crucial that we have uh, full information and uh, not, as I said, ordinary meetings, 16 very important interdepartmental meetings over a long time and indeed uh, uh, correspondence from NGOs also to that. So Thank you, the people Deputy. need to know the full truth. Thank you. I'm not, uh, there's no cover-up, Deputy, and um, there's been a series of Cabinet subcommittee meetings, and of course, Cabinet subcommittee meetings are, are meetings where things are teased out and discussed, uh, various options looked at, various options considered, if that's what you're referring to. But the, 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 the amendment is very basic, and uh, the first, uh, one of the key ones is you know, more in, that, the, that the definition around family should reflect current realities. That's all we're saying to people. I'm sure you're a man that believes in cherishing all the children of the nation equally. 42% of all children born in 2022 were born to an unmarried couple. Are we saying the Constitution shouldn't reflect that? Are we saying they should be excluded from the articles of the Constitution? And we're simply saying uh, in that amendment that we want to cherish all of the children, all the various um, family units, including couples with or without children, single parents and their children. And then you have grandparents who are raising uh, uh, children as well. And we're simply saying all of those should be covered by the new article. Nothing more, nothing less. People are endeavouring to sort of complicate it. People are raising all sorts of red herrings, which I don't believe have real substance. Um, and, that has been, and this has been the motivation of the Oireachtas All-Party Committee as well, um, and that in terms of replacing the, 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 the amendment in terms of replacing the, women's, the, you know, the duties of women in the home, the idea was to replace that with uh, a provision that recognises care in the home um, without discriminating on gender. In other words, care provided in the home by any member of the family um, in, the, in the home, and that the state should strive to support um, that. Uh, <coughs> and that is, in essence, what's before um, the people. It's modest, but it's important. Um, it changes to our constitution, which I think um, are good ones, and I think are, have been welcomed by many, many people who have felt excluded um, for far, far too long um, in, 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 in our uh, society. And there's been much deliberation on these issues, de de Deputy, for I'd say nearly three decades now. It's been the subject of various Oireachtas committees. Now, maybe the present Oireachtas committee that dealt with this, I think Deputy Batchik was the chair of that, may have wished us to go further um, in terms of the, the care dimension to it. But uh, again, in terms of separation of powers, it's important that the Oireachtas of the day and of the future, and the government of the future retains uh, the parliamentary discretion to prioritise allocation of resources in, at budget time. Um, and that has been the essential nature of how we order things in a country that you have a constitution which provides for fundamental rights and is, is essentially a liberal um, rules of law based um, um, document which gives a lot of rights to the citizen, but also then creates the executive, which is the government Thank of the you, day, Tony and Stewart. the parliament to then work through the allocations of resources to the various areas of Time society, education, health, and so forth. In to answer my question, uh, uh, Tarnish, uh, do you know what? If they're trying to rename Parky Creeve, they should call it Park Michal Martin, because you're so good to kick the ball around the pitch and off the pitch, but not you won't play the ball on the pitch, and you won't deal with the questions you're, you're asked. Minister Catherine Martin made an assessment that the Irish Constitution says that a woman's place is in the home. The Supreme Court Judge Mary, Mary Baker, uh, Chair of the Electoral Commission, has clarified that the Constitution makes no such statement whatsoever. It is flabbergasting that the government would, on the one hand, appoint a Supreme Court judge to regulate misinformation during a referendum, and then that judge would say that the government minister's interpretation of uh, the Constitution in the context of the referendum was simply wrong. 
been questioned on this matter, Minister Martin, uh, contradicted the uh, eminent judge and insists her interpretation, is, her interpretation is, is quite clear. So can you turn us to clarify if it's your government's minister's interpretation that is correct or is that of the chair of the electoral commission's position that is correct? And can you clarify that the government's uh, uh, position, uh, we cannot have elect an electoral commission saying that a government minister's interpretation is incorrect and still have confidence in both the minister and the Supreme Court judge and chair of the commission. Thank you, Deputy. We cannot set up a electoral commission to regulate misinformation in relation to a referendum and then turn a blind eye to the disinformation by your government. And what action will be taken against the minister Thank or you. any other government ministers who have played in this misinformation? And I want a direct answer to the question I'm raising, not a trip around Thank the path. Well, could, could I say to Deputy that I, I, I appreciate his plaudits in terms of my capacity to kick the ball around the pitch, but I have to remind, just enlighten the Deputy that my, uh, the position that the selectors decided for me as a young person was cornerback in an era when neither pace, in, a, in an era when neither pace or skill, pace or skill was a premium, uh, and uh, people would understand what I mean by that. Uh, and um, could I say to the Deputy that um, the in terms of the commission that's been established, the role of the commission is to objectively um, assess the proposed changes uh, and explain to the public in an objective way what the impact of the amendment will be. Um, political participants in the campaign, those who are for and those against, will argue uh, in favour of it. Um, I don't accept the charge that you've labelled. I've seen some of the stuff online about disinformation in terms of the difference between duties and place. Uh, and I think that's over the top completely, and it's a complete, uh, I think, misrepresentation uh, of the Minister's presentation. Uh, right, thank the existing you, articles are clear. I think, I would, I, I've, I've asked you, and I think I would have appreciated a response. Do you favour a more inclusive uh, encapsulation of the concept of family as reflected thank, in the modern day you, reality. Uh, the time uh, do you accept that in the modern era that there's 42 percent of children time that are currently up. excluded? Do you think we should bring them in and include them in the constitution? Now we go to the independent group and Deputy Joan Collins as the next. Thanks, Karen Corla. Um, I want to raise a serious issue of the physical segregation of Part Five council tenants and private developments. We now have several examples from all over Dublin of Part 5 council tenants being housed in one block or one area of a development where they are, they are physically separated from other private tenants or occupants. We have all heard the stories of seg segregation of Part 5 tenants in regards to lack of access to amenities or when fees are required for amenities, no access to even pay that fee and so no possibility of having access to amenities. This was the case in the David apartment complex in Drimna, which is a, 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 a built to rent, where myself and my right to change colleague, Councillor Sophie Nicolod, have been working with several tenants. Part five tenants were not given access to the playground for their children, no access to the bike sheds. They were not allowed to pay car parking fees uh, for spaces or other amenities that required a fee, and it's still the case. But I think what is far worse in terms of inclusion is that they were segregated into one block and that is specifically what my question is about today. We see far too many examples of it now. I've seen part five tenants in a complex segregated into one block or put in the corner of the complex where the bins are kept. I know of an LDA in Cherry Orchard, the project there, where part five tenants would be physically segregated. It is uh, built into planning uh, applications, which raises the issue of the quality of these part five properties from day one. A developer knows uh, what block will be for council tenants and not for cost rental or uh, affordable. This physical segregation of part five council tenants seems to be standard practice for Dublin City Council. It is often written into the contracts between DCC and the owners. DCC, DCC say it is too expensive not to physically segregate the council uh, tenants um, and, and uh, pepper pot into the build. Into the build. When I raised this question before and I received this reply from Minister McGrath, who's sitting there beside him, uh, Tanshta, he said, I want to be crystal clear as to what the government position is. We support integration. We do not support segregation. Part five should be seamless in its application because it is a very positive thing that social affordable purchase and private housing are all, are, are all situated together. And that is well and good. But if we have a situation where physical segregation of Part 5 tenants have become a standard practice in councils because they say they cannot afford to, segregate, to not segregate their tenants, then you clearly aren't doing enough to implement your housing for all policy. 
If the case is that ending physical segregation is too costly for councils, which DCC have stated it is at a housing committee meeting recently, it would be necessary for the government to give the councils the funding required to pepper pot Part 5 tenants into private developments. And are you prepared to revise this, uh, Tanisha, and provide the funding? And are you prepared to insist LDAs um, implement Pepper Pot, pot as part of uh, integration? Well, I thank you, Deputy, for, for raising the issue, and I think you raise it very fairly. And I would accept the principles that you've articulated there. There should be no physical segregation. I'm, um, and you, you might amplify for me, or just uh, why are the councils saying that it would be more costly? I don't quite understand why it would be more costly in terms of the construction of a particular 30 apartments, 50 apartments, 100 apartments. You still have to construct the apartments. Um, and uh, the, it, is, it, would, is, it, and it, it is particularly wrong uh, that uh, uh, social housing tenants of uh, Part 5 would be denied access to the amenities or indeed the general facilities. That's wrong. That's not what the Part 5 is about. Uh, it's about a proper balance, a proper mix. Now, I will talk to the Minister. I think the, the, the local authorities can, within their planning conditions, uh, enforce non-physical um, segregation. In other words, they can force integration uh, or, or facilitate integration by a planning condition that makes it um, that the planning permission is dependent on an integrated approach um, uh, to the um, integration of, of social housing tenants in the overall um, um, complex. Because the whole idea of Part 5 was to create integration and to avoid perhaps what people sense, sensed in the historic, historically in the past was, uh, I don't know using the phrase, but an over-concentration or ghettos or whatever the phrase was used. Um, and so that seems to me to be going against the spirit of Part 5 when they were originally conceived. Um, and um, so I will uh, undertake to talk to the Minister, uh, but I do think local authorities have responsibilities as well uh, in terms of the planning permissions uh, that are granted uh, in, 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 in respect of, 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 of part um, fines. And I don't see why it's too costly. I don't quite, um, I mean, in terms of the actual physical cost of constructing um, a, a set of apartments or a housing estate. Um, or whatever, particularly in an apartment um, setting. Um, Tarnish, I don't think, I agree with you, um, but I don't think it's the physical cost, it's the maintenance cost um, from having them segregated. Um, and that's the argument, I think, that was put forward. Um, now, we have a contract, the contract that was uh, signed uh, with DCC and uh, the tenants, so we're looking into that in more detail as to regard what... Um, the issues are there as regards access to amenities. And you must remember that the Davit was built as a build to rent, where under the specifics of the build, those apartments are built smaller, uh, with less storage because they have access to amenities. Um, so there's huge contradictions here. I think there really has to be a review of these, um, of, 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 of uh, um, the Part 5s um, and how they link in. And a discussion with the councils about it as well, the local authorities. What are the issues that they're finding? Why are they? Even in LDAs now in Cherry Orchard, they're putting in segregation, which to me is totally contradiction to Part 5 and the concept um, that has been... Uh, put in housing, your housing for all. And I think it's really incumbent now on yourselves to do that type of work and, and sort this out. It just shouldn't go on. Thank you, Deputy. It's yeah, I mean, the maintenance cost issue seems a weak enough one to me as a basis for that policy. Um, in, in, in terms of uh, you know, arrangements and in many instances, either the councils um, do the maintenance directly themselves or they contract out maintenance in some respects and in, in many developments of this kind they can contract out maintenance um, as, as well in respect of uh, um, part five you could I can see where there can be overlapping issues in respect of a block of apartments where there could be a, a maintenance issue across the entire block that's not insurmountable uh, in terms from a cost perspective shouldn't be insurmountable at all um, so I take your point that, and I will speak to the Minister for Housing on this, and I think we do need to engage with the local authorities here, that they shouldn't take the line of least resistance perhaps, or take an easy option here in terms of the part fives. They need to work harder, uh, uh, and integration is something you work on, you know, uh, and, and develop. I mean, the approved housing bodies, 
uh, whilst the, those who avail of approved body, body housing programmes are generally all on the social housing list, nonetheless there's a degree of integration and the approved housing bodies work hard on the management of, 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 the, of the schemes and also work hard in helping tenants to integrate and, and develop and they also um, Thank you, uh, ensure <coughs> collective maintenance. Okay, thank you. That concludes leader's questions for today. There was more